funktioniert jetzt. So, good morning. <clears throat> good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final day of the course where we'll be going a little bit more biological than we've done so far. So the first lecture today will be about microfluidic approaches and, and what's been done for nucleic acid testing. The second lecture today will be looking at proteins and what kind of tests and assays that people have done with proteins at a larger scale, how they can be translated to the microfluidic format. The third lecture after lunch will be about uh, particle separations, where we won't be looking at just the macromolecules in a cell, but we'll go a step larger and we'll be looking at cell separations and how different active and passive microfluidic approaches can be used to selectively separate cell populations out of a mixture. Um, we will conclude the day by um, looking at a couple of papers and, and find a way of structuring our thoughts when reading a paper, defining where the innovation sits, what the fabrication approach is that's been used, if you agree with everything they've done, if there's any alternatives, and how you could continue, uh, how you could build to, to make that work uh, progress even further. Um, so today will be about nucleic acid testing, but I realized that so far we haven't really touched any nano channels yet. And one of the nice things about uh, people always trying to push the boundaries, that if you can make microfluidic features, you can also make nanofluidic features when channels are smaller than a micron in uh, diameter. And a really nice feature of that is that you can actually, if you apply an electric field across an array of nanochannels, you can uncoil DNA. So I'll first like to show you, um, here we've got a microfluidic structure. You can see the how we had control P, and I've got my laser pointer. Laser pointer here, my laser pointer. We have DNA that's all coiled up sitting here in a chamber. Then the more black area here are nanopores. And if the movie starts, there's an electric field applied and you can see the DNA uncoiling, stretching and finding its way through the pore. Screen. You can see the DNA coming in, it ends up in the nanopore and from a blob that is folded all up, from being a, a blob-like molecule, it stretches out because the nanopore is very thin and finds its way through a nanopore in the electric field. So you can see the blobs moving, bits of DNA come in, and they go through the channel. And as soon as they're out in a non-confined space again, they curl up to their preferred equilibrium configuration. Um, initially, there was a bit of playing around and people were thought it was really cool this has happened. I'm not sure if you have used or heard about DNA sequencing and the nanopore instruments. This technology, uh, this discovery of actually seeing DNA uncoil in uh, nanofluidic channels has led to a lot of this nanopore sequencing because DNA has got a unique ability to, when an electric field is applied, uncoil, and then there's a way of sensing how long it takes to go through that allow you to derive the length of the DNA and even the, the different base pairs have different levels of resistivity. So if you measure the conductivity across the pore, you can even uh, assign the base pair that's coming through. So nanofluidic channels, particularly for DNA sequencing, has allowed a lot more research, has enabled new research and allowed the field of science to progress further. But today we're not talking about the fundamentals of nucleic acids, the way they coil, um, ways to make aptamers. We'll be focusing on nucleic acid testing. And in nucleic acid testing, we've got a, a number of different steps like we have in, um, in, in different parts of the analytical workflow. We start off with a sample that contains uh, the things that we want to test for. And quite typically, we'll see, we'll test for pathogens. So you can see some E. coli and some other 
particle, uh, microorganisms sitting here in the sample. While DNA is a great specific marker for the presence of uh, a microorganism or a certain cell type, the problem with DNA is that it's hiding in the cell's nucleus. So if you want to test and analyze the DNA, you first have to break open the cell to get access to the information that's hiding in that nucleus. So any nucleic acid test, the very first step to do is cell lysis. You need to break open the cell membrane to the, for the cell to release its contents, break open the membrane that's sitting <laughs> around the nucleus so that actually the DNA is free in solution and we can um, do our testing on. Then we've got our DNA floating in a big soup of other agents, which will make a very complex sample. So the next thing is that we go on a little bit of a fishing expedition and we try to capture the DNA in a small volume. So we try to extract and purify the nucleic acids from the very complex sample um, so that they're clean and pure enough for amplification. Then we amplify the DNA and then through one means or another, and we've seen a whole range of different detector technologies, we can detect the DNA. Start off at the start of the process, which is cell lysis. There's different approaches that we can take to cell lysis, and there's nothing different here about microfluidics to any other uh, molecular biology technologies that do DNA analysis. There's two different approaches that we can take. We've got mechanical lysis, where we physically destroy the cells, we mesh them together for them to break open. And we've got chemical lysis, where we use chemicals <coughs> to lyse the cells. And these chemicals may be a detergent to dissolve the lipid bilayer. They may be working on their high pH. Um, they may include the use of chaotropic agents that remove water, that disturb the, the, the semi-crystalline nature of the phospholipid bilayers, and through that degrade the outside of the membranes as well. It may simply contain salts and using osmotic pressure to pop the cells. Um, and there's also enzymes that digest cell membranes. Um, so all of these combinations have been used as well as combinations of them. So you may use a detergent at high pH or a chaotropic reagent in presence of a high salt concentration. So there's a, there's a whole range of different methods that are available and different methods apply to different cell types because a bacterium like E. coli is very easy to pop. Um, whereas uh, spores of a fungus are really hard to lyse. Plant cells have their own problems because plants have a much stiffer outside of the cell membrane than any mammalian cells. So depending on the sample type that you want to get your DNA out of, you may have to go through a, for a different type of lysis. And again, the fundamentals there don't really change between molecular biology at the large scale, as it's already happening. Uh, probably here in the biotechnology school, I've seen a school for human genetics. They all will doing and will have protocols in place for lysis. But if we go to the microfluidic format, um, this is looking a little bit different. And here we've got a first example for uh, chemical lysis on a microfluidic format, and that is using uh, magnetic marbles or metal balls to mechanically squash the cells. So using a spring-loaded system here, these balls are shot like bullets towards the cell towards a microchannel that contains the cell, like we've seen with the valving membrane. The top of the microchannel here, it deforms, and the impact of the ball squashes the cell that sits underneath, and we've mechanically lysed this cell. Um, so while we have a little bit of a, a, a hard, perhaps hard-to-use mechanical setup, the advantage of mechanical lysis is that we don't add any reagents. Because if we do add any chemicals to our lysate, we increase the risk that these chemicals will be transferred through our cleaning process into amplification. And during amplification, they may inhibit the effectiveness of the enzymes that do the amplification and prevent us from um, having a proper readout. So the use of chemicals, whilst really effective, 
um, needs to be done in a conservative manner as well, because otherwise we may get problems further down the track. Using the beads was reasonably effective. So about half of the cells got disrupted. Um, and, and that could be improved to around 70, 80 percent, um, as described in the paper, uh, when cells were exposed to the bullets coming down on a repeat basis. So not that nice and simple engineered solution to lie cells by just squashing them inside a microchannel so that they burst open and they release their contents ready for further processing. What they will probably do in uh, your medicine de department, biotechnology, is grind things together. I think it's pottering that's called. I remember doing an undergrad experiments with uh, a weird buzzing instrument. So we put a liver in and we move the thing up and down, uh, pretty much like a stick mixer. And it did grind all the cells apart to bits so that we the cells would release their contents. Grinding has also been demonstrated on a microfluidic format by having a cell created with sharp, sore teeth at the bottom. So if the cells are being pumped into the microfluidic channel, we can push them and move them around by putting pressure on the flexible membrane here. If we force the cell onto the sharp dots, uh, by changing, alternating the pressure, you move them around, you wiggle them around, they pop open, they release their contents. This in here, second membrane here, is a membrane with a cutoff where the cells can't fit through, and then depending on the cell type, there may be 10 to 15 micron. So if these pores are one micron or smaller in diameter, the cells can't get through, but the molecules released by the cell can be collected at the, at the outlet. Or the others working. So mechanical ways, either using um, the balls, very similar to the, the ball mill, or approaches that are very similar to grinding can be translated to microfluidic format as well. Uh, another option is to use ultrasonic fields. So here we've got a microfluidic device. Um, it's finger actua 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 so samples can actually be loaded in with a little pump that you can um, activate by simply pushing a membrane up and down with your finger. And by doing that, you can pump liquids like, like a hand pump. You can pump liquids into the microfluidic device. Um, metering is to make sure all the volumes are there. Um, this is a, a fairly advanced device. So we already have compartments in there with blisters that contain the reagents. And in this um, instance, it's a commercially sourced license buffer. Um, device can be interfaced with a blood sampling device, pumping, optical sound forward, checking what's going on, a filter, um, and interestingly, an acoustofluidic mixer. Um, remember on our very first day, we were talking microfluidic devices, low Reynolds numbers, poor mixing. We had approaches, passive approaches for mixing, uh, having very long channels. We also discussed active approaches for mixing, where ultrasound uh, was one of the options. Here we can see that we've got a piezoactive actuator that starts vibrating. We've got a PDMS device here. And if you've got a PDMS device with sharp corners that you can see here, we get square corners coming down then the field created by the piezoelectronic actuator concentrates on those corners and we start getting recirculatory flow that helps us for mixing. Here we've got an example where we fill fluorescent dye into the chamber. The piezoelectric activator is being put on at a percentage of its maximum power. And you can see nice homogeneity um, after about one and a half, two minutes, it is possible to see that we've got 100% mixing in that reservoir. So this piezoelectric device for mixing was used to mix a cell, a mix, a, a cell um, suspension with a commercially available lysis buffer to then get lysis on the chip 
and be able to continue with processing. So chemical lysis can be done on the chips as well, but we need to mix them through and we may be able to use passive or active mixers to do so. In this instance, this example, there is an active micro mixer being used that use, uses a little piezo electric actuator um, that's simply glued on the bottom of the device. Another example here, or uh, looking at the effectiveness of, of the of lysis buffer, is here we've got the blood sample um, before addition of the, the, the lysis buffer. And if you centrifuge, you've got the, the complete blood, um, red blood cells still sitting at the bottom. Here we've got blood and PB, uh, PBS, again, cells collected at the bottom. In the areas where we have added the lysis buffer, you can see that even after centrifugation, there is no cells are left because all the cells are broken apart. So this demonstrates we've got effective lysis. Um, if we measure the hemoglobin, those analytical measurements confirm that the chemical lysis uh, either done on the chip we just looked at or just sitting in the bench and putting it on a vortex mixer, uh, we get complete lysis. And there's no significant difference between getting the lysis done with the chip-based mixer to getting the lysis done in a, uh, in a container on the bench, as has been done for a very long time by molecular biologists. So we can break up cells. We have the similar kind of toolkit for conducting cell lysis on a microfluidic device, as we already have on the bench. We've got options that are mechanical. We have options that are chemical. Um, mechanical needs more complex setup, but doesn't add any chemicals. If we do add chemicals, we may also have to um, introduce an active or a passive way to mix the lysis reagents in our sample. Next step in DNA analysis is the extraction and purification of the nucleic acids. And most of the time that is done using functionalized paramagnetic beads. Again, if any of you is working with DNA extraction as part of your research project, this will be maybe exactly the same as the protocols that you're already following with the DNA extraction kits that you buy uh, from all the, 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 the large chemical suppliers. So um, we've got fused silica, we've got glass beads that have a negative surface charge and it is hydrated. We add a chaotropic agent, which uh, decreases the level of dehydration at the, the bead. And by working at high pH, we can also deprotonate the surface. So we've got a water poor, negatively charged surface. The sodium ions that are present in the solution really, really like being close to the highly negatively charged surface. So we get an assembly of our uh, sodium ions uh, as we're working in a high sodium chloride environment. We get an accumulation of the sodium ions, positively charged, at the negatively charged surface. And it's the positive charge of the sodium ions that then attracts the negatively charged DNA to bind. So we're working, because of the chaotropic agents, we're working in a relatively low water environment. We get negative surface charge is compensated, overcompensated by the positive ions, sodium ions that sit on top. The positive charge of these sodium ions attracts and binds the DNA. So even though we've got negatively charged beads, it still binds the negatively charged DNA because we've got this interfacial layer of the positively charged sodium ions. The same phenomena is uh, underpinning the SPRI effect and solid phase. Uh, so SPRI is a sample preparation method that is quite often used after PCR and before sequencing to selectively isolate a DNA sequence of a certain length. Again, we've got the beads that in presence of the salt and quite often PEG is, is present as well. We get a positive ionic layer formed around the beads and the DNA sticks to that. If we then change the chemical conditions, we can change the preference of the sodium ions to actually be sit situated on the carboxylate or the negatively charged coating. So we just looked at as IoT. Here's carboxylated. It's still the negative charge. If we change the chemistry 
these sodium ions don't want to be that close to the surface anymore. So the, the attractive force for the DNA is disappearing and our DNA is being released. Another thing, and those of you that are doing gel electrophoresis for their project, DNA can actually be quite effectively captured in a gel. So you can also use a hydrogel to retain the DNA whilst other compounds are uh, being eluded away. So a cross-linked gel can also be used for um, the extraction of purification of DNA. We've as a very nice feature in the, the article here is that they actually then also infuse, so they diffuse out the uh, um, small molecules from the lysate, then they infused in reagents for amplification, and they could actually, within the gel network, do localized digital amplification of the DNA. In addition to working with a negative charge compensated by the positive charge, there's also cationic amines that directly electrostatically can interact with the DNA. It can be bound if we change the pH from low to high, the positive charge disappears and that then provides an option to elude the DNA. So DNA is a negative molecule. If you've got any background in ion chromatography, similar binding and elution patterns uh, where you would use an ion exchange material for solid phase extraction apply when we do solid phase extraction of DNA. Um, problem is that we need to not only bind the DNA, but we need to wash it as well. We have our DNA in presence of all kinds of contaminants. We can stick the DNA to the beads, but then we probably need to do a little bit, a bit of washing. In the lab, that's quite easy because you can hold your magnets in place, you pipette solutions in and out. In microfluidics, we would like to automate that. And IFAST, immiscible filtration assisted by surface tension, is one of the approaches how that's been realized. And what happens is that initially in IFAST, they had two reservoirs with extra solution connected with an um, immiscible solvent bridge. So for example, octanol. The DNA is sitting on negatively charged magnetic beads. A magnet can be moved through the organic phase. It pull, if it's moved under the chip, it pulls the magnetic beads along. If the pulling force of the magnet is higher than that of the surface tension between the aqueous phase in the reservoir and the octanol that's sitting in the connecting channel, you can actually move the beads, but not the solution, from one chamber to another. So IFAST, immiscible filtration assisted by surface tension, was initially invented with using water and organic solvents. Um, anything has been used, including um, olive oil. And here, this research article has improved on that a little bit more recently using a gel-like material with the advantage that the gel, the gel is still hydrophilic. So it was proven to be much more effective to remove the last bits of surface water surrounding the beads as carryover was a significant issue in the IFAS process because the hydrophilic beads, when introduced into the organic solvents, the water that was stick on the, stuck on the outside had no affinity at all to the octanol sitting on top. So it stayed there carrying a lot of contaminants still along from one fluidic environment to the other fluidic environment. And here the organogel kind of um, addressed that issue. So here we've got uh, the microfluidic device sitting on a thin film. The thin film here is to ensure we've got very good coupling of the magnetic field by this magnet to the beads that are in our device. We've got our whole blood sample here uh, with our magnetic beads um, and added the reagent, cathotropic agent, and the salt to ensure good binding of the DNA. Whole blood is being lysed, DNA binds to the bead, the magnet moves, and the beads are pulled with the magnet through the gel like matrix. You can see that it leaves a little bit of the liquid behind. Again, unlike the organic solvent that was hydrophobic, the organogel is still a, a hydrophilic phase. So we get effective cleaning of the beads while they're being dragged through the gel to then end up in a nice and clean environment where by a little bit of moving around of the beads, you could actually nicely wash and shake them around for some agitation. <laughs> 
iFast has been done in a much more advanced way as well. And, and this is a recent article where they uh, captured some RNA. Uh, capturing RNA has been particularly popular since the COVID outbreak because everybody wanted to have a COVID testing device. So the more recent articles uh, that we're talking about today, uh, and I think yeah, one, one that we'll talk about this afternoon as well, we'll be looking at COVID because COVID has been very abundant in the literature. People got motivated by sitting at home. So here we've got um, a lysate from probably a nose swab where we've got different bits of cells sitting around as well as uh, after lysis are freed up COVID RNA. So the magnetic beads with an oligo on there, a little spaghetti of DNA that could bind to the RNA of the virus are being put in this very large chamber. Look at this chamber, watch how big this chamber is. And that means that we can actually inject a relatively large volume. We can bind by, by agitating with the magnet underneath as we've just already seen. We can go fishing with the magnetic beads and capture as much DNA as we can, and then concentrate it on the chip into a relatively small volume, which means that we will have high sensitivity because we started with high volume, we concentrate down into the low volume for our testing. So the magnetic beads are used for DNA capture. Then they are moved through an IFAS system where we first have, in this case, they're still using the oil phase. So there's a little bit of that res uh, residual water in there. So we've got an additional wash, wash step. So we get the magnets to be moving around through the oil, through the first wash, through the oil, through the second wash, through the oil, um, through another aqueous phase where probably the reagents are added, then the DNA is being released and then there's amplification by lamp. And we'll be talking about a little bit more about amplification later on, which we will be starting off very soon. So clean up. Whereas with a lot of the articles, um, it started off where only the amplification was being done on chip and all the sample preparation was done with kits on the bench before injecting into the fluidic device. There is a growing number of options to actually do on chip lysis and DNA extraction, keeping in mind that sometimes uh, solutions like these are being used where there's a very large sample chamber in order to collect as much DNA as you can. Um, to ensure that there will be sufficient co copy numbers so that uh, someone that's sick actually get a, gets a positive outcome in the test. Our um, next topic that we'll be talking about is our different amplification methods. And again, if you've got a background in molecular biology, they are the same essays. So you probably know it better than I do. PCR is and remains the golden standard of amplification. So what happens in PCR is that we have our DNA molecules. They are heated up to a denaturing temperature of 95 degrees, where our nicely coiled um, double-stranded DNA is denatured into two separate strands. So they're split apart. That is required for our primers to be able to selectively bind to the two complementary strands. So we've got the a three and a five, uh, the three and the five prime uh, primers to bind the DNA. At that point, we get tech polymerase to come in and tech polymerase moves past the DNA and forms the new complementary strand. So we started off with one bit of DNA, broke it apart. These are two complementary strands. When this is an A, this is a T, but this is a C, that is a G. They're broken apart. The primers bind to either strand and make the complementary one. So the tech polymerase that is moving along this DNA strand is pretty much synthesizing this one. The tech polymerase that's moving, binding to the primer and moving and synthesizing DNA, moving that way, is replicating this strand. What we end up with is both of the strands that we started with end up with a new complementary strand, which means that we now, instead of having one copy of the DNA, we've got two. Then it happens again with the two, 
a little bit four, and it exponentially grows and we get more and more copies of our DNA. Chemistry doesn't change really when we go to the micro scale, but what we can change is do it faster. And that's what the Landers Group has done more recently. Um, they've developed um, uh, a fast PCR system where they've got an inlet for a microfluidic chamber that was really thin to sit next to uh, a Peltier element to organize heating and cooling. Because if we remember what was happening with during PCR, we've got the denaturing that needs to happen at 95 degrees <coughs> Celsius. We've got the tech polymerase, the synthesis, that happens at around 55 degrees Celsius. To start our new cycle, we need to again denature these newly synthesized strengths, which means that we need to thermocycle. We need to jump to 95, go back to 55, jump to 95, go back. That's a thermocycling, and, and that requires very good thermal control. The reason our PCR test for COVID all took a little bit longer, because PCR is a, a bit of a slow process, because all those Eppendorf cups in the PCR machines need to be heated and cooled and heated and cooled and heated and cooled. And each of those steps takes some time. Here, the heating and cooling is placed really, really close to a very, very small amplification chamber. Small thermal mass, good transfer of heat. That means that the heating and cooling can go a lot faster than a normal PCR. And that's shown here. If we look at a normal PCR in a P PCR machine, we've got close to an hour of heating up, cooling down, heating up, cooling down. If we go to this chip-based system, we can decrease that down by a factor of time uh, five to only have 10 minutes of very quick up, down, up, down, up, down. And as you can see here in the microfluidic system, we get very similar amplification outcomes. We get similar C2, CT or CQ values compared to a commercial PCR system, but we've reduced our amplification time, the time that it takes for a PCR reaction, reaction to take place from 50 to 10 minutes. Very nicely for those of you that do PCR, we've got a nicely a slope of minus three here and a good R square value, meaning that our amplification operates the way it should be working. So this is PCR, if you've done any PCR, Microfluidic PCR is just a PCR reaction. If we do real-time monitoring of what's going on, we do real-time PCR, but then in a smaller volume with enhanced control. Um, this, however, is a bit of a beast of a setup. And the reason it's a bit of a beast of a setup is because we need to have that control of heating and cooling very efficiently, which means that we've got the, the bulky Peltier elements here. And people have realized that maybe PCR, whereas it's, whilst it's a golden standard and works really well, um, is not the best thing on earth. And a whole range of isothermal amplification um, techniques has been thrown onto the market. I quite like this uh, review article where they made a very nice plot from the temperatures that the PCR uh, works at, as well as the development stage. Is it a very well established? Uh, platform or amplification approach that's already been commercialized or is it very early stage proof of concept work where you may even have to uh, recombinantly make your own enzymes before you start amplifying. For the chip work it's probably most relevant to look at what's going on in on the more commercially um, already available ones where we've got rolling uh, circle amplification, RPA, DESMA, and LAMP as the big ones, and they have been um, all translated to the microfluidic format. All these amplification techniques all have their own pros and cons. And while reading it now here in the lecture is not possible, I think it's good for reference if you would have an interest in DNA amplification to have a look at this, this table because it provides the um, pros and cons very clearly of the different amplification techniques. Um, if we look at a bit more detail, we um, look for an example. Ah, I'm changing my slides. It's uh, bobbing around. So um, for PCR, and that, that's the column here, primer design is simple. It's not hard to design a PCR primer. Whereas if you go for LAMP, primer design is really hard. If you look at the target, 
PCR, targets DNA. So if you want to do RNA, you need to do reverse transcriptions. It can be done, but not great. Nespine contrast targets RNA directly. So if you want to look at viral RNA, maybe Nespa is the amplification technique that's more appropriate for you to select than other ones. How long does the reaction take? PCR in a normal instrument, two to three hours. Either we set, accelerate the thermocycling, like we've just seen the Landers group does, or maybe we want to go to LAMP, which is less than an hour, or we want to go to RPA, where we can get our amplification done in only 20 minutes. So all these amplification techniques have got their own <coughs> niches, their own applications where they're really, really good, and the situations where they're actually not that good. So I'll quickly talk you through a couple of these um, RPA, uh, the different isothermal amplification techniques. Um, they are all similar but different. So we've got recombinized polymerase amplification, which is fairly similar where we get a strand displacement step we then get the primers to bind and replicate the DNA and get the circus to go all over again. The uh, difference with PCR is that the strand displacement here is not done by thermal melting, but it's actually done by an enzyme. And that means that the amplification can be done isothermally. LAMP is a little bit more temperamental, a little bit more complex. So I'll show you a little movie how LAMP application works. Go to the place. No, so the low down here of lamp is that the uh, lamp amplification. There's two different primers that bind. The first primer. Oh, maybe we are playing. Are we just not, not hearing the voice? So we've got forward and reverse primers on my target DNA that are binding. This is where the animation will be starting. So you can see that we've got three forward primers, three backward primers. There's one that binds. Back one, one, one. And we get amplification taking place. A little overhang there creates a loopy thingy. And it doesn't work as well without the narration in there. Um, so we, we get the different primers to bind to then form there we go. So they then need to fall together for the actual amplification to start taking place. Watch it at YouTube. It goes a bit faster if you watch it on YouTube yourself and you can understand that actually the, it's very critical to get the primer design correct. And while there are some computer packages now that are increasingly effective at getting your lamp primer set correct, um, from experience in our group, we need to order three, four different primer sets to evaluate them and see if we actually get an amplification product or not. So it, it's not as easy to do as PCR is. Rolling circle amplification is another technique where instead of having uh, separate strands of DNA, the amplification makes the DNA into a circle, which means that we get a very long bit of DNA being formed as our amplification product. And then we can, um, on that lo very long bit of DNA, new rolling amplification systems can start happening. So we get 
a very diverse mix in different lengths of amplification products being formed. Um, one of the favorites that we've done some playing around in the biochemistry with, um, which if there's anyone that's got a high interest in biochemistry, may show you that whatever in the box doesn't mean that you can't play with it. So Nespa is one of our other um, isothermal amplification techniques, which uses a combination of different enzymes. And we start off with AMVRT, which is one of the enzymes that elongates a primer one that bounds to the RNA, creating a cDNA copy. Then we get RNase H, which hydrolyzes the RNA portion of the hybrid, leaving the single-stranded DNA that was just formed. And we get the annealing of primer two. Then our AMVRT enzyme returns and elongates the primer two to make the promoter transcriptionally active. We get T7, the RNA polymerase, to copy the RNA into a new RNA strand. We then get primer one again to bind to that transcript, uh, transcribed RNA, at which point our cycle is complete. And we get multiple RNA copies, so we get multiple uh, opportunities for primer one to bind, and we can get start the amplification in multiple cycles again. And this all happens at uh, 41 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, the whole thing only starts if primer one is for the very first step hybridized to the um, target RNA. And that happens at 65 degree. And we can't do that as a one pop mixture because the enzymes here, um, RNase H, T7 RNA polymerase and AMVRT are not stable at 62 degrees Celsius, 65 degrees Celsius where we need to do the annealing. So that heating step is kind of taking away the potential of NESPA for integration in microfluidic systems because we'd need an additional fluidic handling step to first anneal the primer to then introduce it to the reagents to start amplification at 41 degrees Celsius. And we'd really love to do that all as a one pot uh, truly isothermal uh, protocol. And as you can see here, people have recognized that the T7, the thermolabel nature of T7 and RNAs H are blocking its commercial potential. So what we've done um, is in, in my research group is to see if we could find a way to eliminate that 65 degree annealing stage and actually replace that with the use of an enzyme. So that's been tried before. You can get a little bit of that annealing happening by through the addition of the DMSO, but that also slowed down the amplification. So we started looking at single strand binding proteins uh, that are used, RPA uses single strand binding proteins, as I just said, to prevent that, that thermal annealing step. So we um, did the screening of a range of different single strand binding DNA, uh, binding strands. Um, to conduct enzymatically that, that initial hybridization step. So no heating, we added a single cell binding protein. And as you can see here, uh, we did get amplification um, without, in our one-step NESMA, with only initially a slight delay in amplification. So this is the two-step protocol where we get an amplification product after kind of 28. We got it after 31, but you can see that actually we can rescue, we can eliminate the thermal step by using a single strand binding protein. Let's see here that our new methods, um, after some optimizing for uh, HIV, you can see here using our single strand binding protein, we got earlier beyond the threshold in amplification than using this single pop NESPA. Um, again, a little bit zoomed in there, and it is a lot better than using DMSO as a purely chemical way to melt the DNA. So we get, could get good times to positivity, and that shows you as an example, if there is a bottleneck in, an, in, in, in a process, you may wanna other is James it, co-technology, your bottleneck is the heating and cooling, so you develop a very fast thermocycle. There may also be enzymatic or ways known in biochemistry to actually get that melting, the primer annealing done differently. 
with the mission of going to a microfluidic system where we want to minimize the fluidic handling to limit the compactness of our microfluidic devices. Keep in mind that a lot of the protocols that have been developed by the molecular biologists were all developed with the idea there would be gels around, there would be pipettes around, there would be centrifuges around, there would be fridges, there would be great infrastructure. What we want to do as a microfluidic community is take that knowledge, put it in a little bag and take it out in the field. But we don't want to take the fridge and the centrifuge and all the, and the pipettes and all the other uh, infrastructure around. Some of the approaches they have developed that may work quite well, some approaches that may be a little bit more cumbersome and either need a different approach, different take on it, um, or, or some extra instrumentation, or you do need to carry a centrifuge or a way of... Uh, so people have actually used drones to do the centrifugation of Eppendorf tubs because they are things that researchers quite often have with them in the field. If you want to do some environmental sampling, you may want to take some images of a river. You've got a rotating, rotating thing around. If you want to do some DNA testing and your protocol requires a centrifuge, you can actually put your Eppendorf tubes on the edges of the blades of a drone as well and use your drone as a centrifuge. Works as well. So whatever your situation is, you may be able to find a solution that fits that problem. Last year, a part of our DNA amplification, and I, can, I think I can hear tea coming, uh, of our uh, after amplification is that we can't uh, detect our amplification product. Optical is easy. Visual detection, um, the lateral flow assays that we've talked about with the gold nanoparticles, you can also have those gold beads having the complementary strength of a DNA amplification product and have a lateral flow read out after PCR instead of having a, a, a much more bulky detector. So um, LAMP and, and RPA are particularly good in um, uh, no, no, the CRISPR. CRISPR allows you for creating a lot more light and fluorescence out of a, a couple of detection products than any other techniques. We'll be looking at CRISPR a little bit later. And that means that if you combine CRISPR chemistry for detection, you can actually just see your Eppendorf tube turning yellow or not. And there's some very nice coulometric detection approaches for LAMP, where um, if your reaction product is present, it turns pink. And if not, it stays yellow. So you can just look at your tube and you'll say yes, no. PCR machines are typically equipped with a fluorescence detector. So PCR on the chip can be done very well with a fluorescence detector as well. Um, it can be done using an intercalating dye or having a molecular beacon to have a, an additional step of selectivity in your detection because you can only get light if your amplification product is present. Um, we've played around with some electrochemiluminescence with molecular beacons where we only got chemiluminescence being taken place once uh, or electrochemiluminescence taking place once the molecular beacon got opened up through the presence of our target DNA. Electrochemical detection are also an, an option, as I said, lateral flow ship, uh, chips, and there's particular DNA sensitive biosensors as well that can be used either in conjunction with an amplification or amplification can be skipped all the way, particularly if the DNA levels are relatively high. So we can all put that together in a device and we've been already through a few. I thought that we just closed the, the, this lecture with one example on how that can be put together into a microfluidic device. Um, but there is thousands uh, of, of examples of people that have done DNA extraction amplification on a microfluidic device. So this is a recent example and I particularly liked it because it was so easy to use. So we've got different reaction chambers that is separated by these little carbon fiber rods that are at the moment temporarily keep the different reagents separated from one another. Reagents are present in the chambers, isolated with these rods. So we've got the solution, the reagents for the RPA amplification reaction. And here we'll have a little slide on how we can use CRISPR chemistry for detection. CRISPR is very popular by molecular biologists because you can do gene editing with it. CRISPR is finding a complete new life in enabling sensitive detection visual readouts. So CRISPR is, is very popular. So 
start off with doing RPA, CRISPR, and then a visual readout to detect the presence or absence of the amplification product. Fabrication, there's a template being printed uh, in PV PVA, replicated in PDMS. Um, the core is, what is uh, dissolvable in ethanol, so we can then um, dissolve that wherever the object was, we have a channel left in our PDMS device. Carbon rods are fluidic barriers that can manually, you can open them and you open the valve and get fluidic contact. You can push them back in and you close the valve again. And the device was relatively small. Not sure what this nation the coin is, but coins are typically not big unless you've got the Australian um, 50 cent coin because that's about that large. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the exception. So here you can see some colored dyes to illustrate the fluidic insulation. You can see none of the yellow here is moving into the blue zone. So these carbon rods are actually really effective, keeping these little containers separate. CRISPR for detection. And the way they call the CRISPR detection is collateral cleavage. So we've got our Cas12 protein that if our um, CRISPR RNA that can combine with our CRISPR RNA. If our COVID, uh, in this case was a COVID test, COVID fragment is present, then it binds to the specifically designed CRISPR RNA and we create activity of the CRISPR-Cas enzyme. If this CRISPR-Cas enzyme gets active, it chops any bit of DNA that it can find. We had our reporter DNA that had a quencher to it, so it was no fluorescence. This activated CRISPR enzyme, it chops every bit of DNA it can find around, cleaving all the quenches away from the fluorophores, and that allows for the release of a lot of fluorescence. So instead of only getting one molecule of fluorescence per molecule of DNA presence, we get lots of fluorescence being created continuously through activation of that CRISPR-Cas enzyme. So cool chemistry that's been developed by molecular biologists, um, reasonably user friendly if you can get your hands on the enzyme and, and can, was therefore adopted in this assay where you can see RPA's DNA target is injected, which means that a sample preparation here was not done on chip. The first two pins are being pulled, so the target drops down into the RPA mixture. Um, then the next pins are being pulled, the re uh, reagents end up with the CRISPR-Cas solution. And here you can see that we get our fluorophore being cleaved whenever our amplification product for Cas-CoV-2 is present. If any of the other viruses that um, we could be very similar were present, we got no amplification. So we've got, in addition to selective amplification, we also have selective detection. And you can see very nicely that our color intensity was correlated with our um, concentration of our target RNA. So we could also quantify the number of copies that were present. This is just one example of a very easy to use, very practical for infield use, DNA or RNA amplification and detection device. Um, as I just said, there's a couple of review articles mentioned in the notes of this lecture. If you've got an interest on, in DNA or RNA amplification on a chip, um, please look for something that's close and similar to your application of liking, and, and then you'll find yourself a way through. Let's break for morning tea, and then we'll be back looking at what we can do with proteins. Unless there are any questions. Always happy for those. So I hope we now have all the engineers and the hardcore chemists uncomfortable in the room and we've got all those people that do biotechnology. Yeah, we know this. I go for tea. I hope you do too. Yeah. 
I'll 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 first see if I can get the receipt copy work. Thank you. 
Okay, um, in order for all of us to be able to have lunch, or I think I need to just go to the bank and do some things there after uh, lunch, let's make a start and switch gears a little bit, stay with the bio micromolecules, but now we're going to have a little look of proteins, where um, I just grabbed a number of different examples uh, of different studies that are done on proteins. Uh, but then microfluidically. So we'll do anything from affinity interaction measurements to uh, proteomics coupling chips to the mass spec. So again, it will be a very wide selection, that not, not necessarily for all of you to memorize anything that can be done with a protein, but to give a little bit of a, a grasp how big the opportunities are of microfluidics um, for also any kind of research involving uh, peptides, proteins. Um, so, in the analytical workflow with proteins, we have two different ways, we, two different reasons we would like to separate proteins. First one is analytical, where we want to do full analysis, partial analysis, and we may use liquid chromatography or a wide range of uh, uh, electrophoretic approaches, zone electrophoresis, ITP, isoelectric focusing, um, and, and different approaches, including stationary phases. Another way why we'd like to do proteins, and that may be more appropriate for you if you're in the biotechnology sphere, is to clean them up, to actually get a protein out of a soup. 
And those are called preparative separations, where we want to do clean up before further, further processing, maybe before uh, blotting on the gel, maybe before mass spectrometry. And, and, and techniques that could be used there are, for example, field flow fractionations. A third thing that's done with proteins is studying how they interact with other molecules, other proteins, drugs, DNA. There's a whole field of study out there as well. So um, perhaps more so even than with DNA, there's a lot of different experiments, a lot of different researches from biophysics to biotechnology, medicine, um, all different reasons of working with protein. Again, substantiating why we just get a little bit of a, a cherry out of different baskets this morning, how microfluidics can actually help some of that work. Um, in general, miniaturized devices represent ideal platforms for the analysis of small sample amounts. All the omics have found a flourishing ground in the microfluidic instrumentation development areas. So proteomics, glycomics, genomics, all the omics are benefiting from miniaturization because there's a gain in speed, a gain in performance, a gain in throughputs, and we can do so with small amounts of sample. And if you want to isolate a protein from somewhere, you're typically not isolating it by the gram or kilogram. You're typically talking milli or microgram scale. So having analytical tools can actually deal with small mass, small volumes are highly beneficial. Um, so the microfluidic toolbox, it, it contains a whole range of different things. We've got flow man manipulation approaches. We had hydrodynamically driven flow. We have electric fields we can use to manipulate the flows in microchannels. We've got acoustic effects. Weirdly enough, with sounds, we can manipulate flows. Um, with light, we've got optical tweezers. We can actually lift things up with, with just light. And we've got magnetic uh, ways that we can move things around in fluids as well. We've got different operation modes, but open devices where we can actually see what's in the channels and, and potentially add things. Most of our channels that we've been used have been closed. Um, but we've done paper fluidics, they're open. We've had a little bit of a, a snapshot that there's actually threads of fabric. You can do uh, chemical experiments as well, as well. These are all typically discrete. We've got continuous flow separations. Think back about the free flow electrophoresis that we uh, visited. Droplets, where we get segmented flow. And there's digital microfluidics, which is an area where I thought we were getting too broad if we would get into there as well. But digital microfluidics, we've seen digital PCR, it is doing everything on separate droplets. Again, it can be done in micro channels or it can be done on surfaces. Um, different separation techniques, field flow fractionation is popular for proteins. We've got our electromigration, our chromatographic approaches. Detection can be optical, either using the absorbance, absorbance ratios of proteins, uh, an absolute blessing are fluorescent proteins, so green fluorescent proteins or r erythrin are naturally fluorescent. Really, if you want to demonstrate a concept with a protein, pick those because you don't need to do any labeling. Electrochemically, there's electrochemically active proteins, or you can label them so you can see them electrochemically. Um, sensing with impedance is done as well. And of course, mass spectrometry, particularly if your application ends up in the proteomics, peptidomics, um, and the, uh, testing, then mass spec becomes your uh, uh, field. Um, we'll have also have a look on how we can actually start quantifying protein-protein interactions using some microfluidics. So again, we're back at our pictures of microchannels. Um, what kind of microchannel are we looking at here? So we've got a two-phase aqueous system which means that we've got two aqueous solutions that still don't want to mix. And that's because one of them has got polyethylene glycol in there. So immiscible aqueous uh, solutions. And what you can do is do liquid-liquid extraction in them. So here in A, you can see hydrodynamic focusing and partitioning of a sample stream. So you can see that our sample here is focused between peg on one side, salt on the other side, 
and we get selective extraction of one protein and not others uh, from our sample flow into the pack phase. So, oh, oh no, this is not even a protein, this is just FITC. So FITC partitions strongly into the pack rich phase, which means that you can separate it out from a component that doesn't have that affinity for, uh, for PEG. Here the, on, on B, we were doing some uh, protein separations. So I was a, a picture too early. So here we've got a partitioning, different partitioning between BSA. BSA is not autofluorescent, unlike green fluorescent protein. So here it's been labeled with lexafluor, which is a, a dye that's got a excitation emission properties very similar to fluorescein, but it's a little bit more stable and has got less bleaching problems. And we've got another protein, in this case an enzyme, which is uh, galactosidase. And galactosidase is beta galactosidase <coughs> is labeled in red. So we get two different proteins here, one a mixture coming in. We can see that our proteins are preferentially sitting in one phase or another in our true a liquid system. We can see that the red protein preferentially distributes into the pack rich top phase, whereas the green labeled BSA preferentially partitions into the other one. So we can separate these two proteins depending on their preference on sitting in a more salt environment or more pack rich environment. And you can see that over time in the channel, if we start off with a mixture of our green and our red, protein, the further we go down our channel, the longer our target analytes have had to distribute in one channel or another. And three centimeters in, close to the outlet, we almost have a full separation of our two different proteins. So you can see here that the red one goes up into the pack phase, the green one goes down. So we can do liquid-liquid extraction, uh, play around with partitioning in the two-phase microfluidic system. Uh, here we've got a. Why do I now have a writer? I didn't want. I just want a mouse. Um, and then I still want to be here. So oh, here we've got a APTS extraction system where, again, we've got. Uh, in, in this case, we've got PEG or PGA. We've got a crude membrane extract. We get the partitioning taking place. The water soluble proteins are going into the PGA, into the more water. water uh, <coughs> we've got this channel here. We've got two different liquids moving in parallel. That's an easy way to explain. We've got a hydrophilic environment in the two outer channels and a hydrophobic environment in the middle. We introduce a mixture of proteins, which then distribute either in the hydrophilic environments where they like to be, or they remain in the hydrophobic environments, which allows for the separation of the more hydrophilic from the more hydrophobic proteins. And using a, a Y-shaped channel intersection at the outlet, we can separate these proteins out. Here again, we can extract the label IgG from the pack rich phase. We've got a long channel where we get together. And you can see that in the outlets, we get increasing amounts of our target analyte in the side streams and not so in the central. So they're useful for microfluidic system. Why would we like to do that? And sometimes with proteomics, we want to actually look at one section of proteins and not at any of the other. So what the uh, microfluidic aqueous systems have been used for is that we used that the partitioning of the proteins was used to then further analyze them by um, different protein analysis projects. So these different fractions were collected at the outside of the chip and they could identify what the plasma-based uh, proteins were and what the other proteins are. <coughs> you expect plasma proteins to be much more lipophilic because they sit in the bilayer, and this then allows for further characterization 
of the membrane-based protein based on their function. Membrane-based proteins are always very hard to extract from a sample. By having, this was one that had a good picture in there, by having a hydrophobic place where we can selectively collect our hydrophobic proteins, which are primarily a membrane-based proteins, we can get a, a, a protein mixture in a detergent in. Detergent is needed here to have them lipophilic. The hydrophilic ones will go to the aqueous phase. The lipophilic ones will remain here in, in, the, or, in the organic phase which allows for the selective collection of our lipophilic proteins and then further do the analysis of the cleaned up fraction of these proteins. These ones have, this is two pack flows, two pack flows, flows and one organic. So this doesn't have a salt gradient in that. Uh, the other one had a salt gradient, yeah. probably two uh, have, there was no organic phase here to probably to uh, enhance salting out effect. That's what I suspect. So one of us uh, said, suppose salt said stops for some time, and both sides will get the back only, but it gets separated at the other end. If you would stop the salt flow, so stop somehow. We are not stopping it, but stop somehow. Stop it or something. Then, and with separation. Then the separation will stop. So if we've got a blockage somewhere, we probably don't have separation anymore. So if we have a blockage here at this outlet. Not in the, in the beginning. Uh, yes. So if we've got a blockage here, yeah. then, then we only have pack. pack and then both sides yeah. Pack. So then the uh, green one will still move into the pack rich phase, but we won't have the clean separation or the red one will move to the pack phase. We won't have the clean separation because we'll have a little bit of diffusion. So our resolution that we achieve here will probably be lower. So we won't get them that much pulled apart. Is what I suspect, based on the quick read of the papers. Um, so, so proteins themselves, they are not just sitting there by themselves. They contain a lot of information and organize a lot of bioprocessing. <coughs> Mostly they do that by through protein-protein interactions. So they um, non-covalently or covalently interact, cause configurational changes, and that gets the biochemistry to take place. Because there are so many protein-protein interactions, there is a demand for experimental technique where we can actually um, study protein-protein interactions in solutions that mimic the biological environment, um, sometimes with a very short assay scale. One of the last examples we'll be talking through is a very, very quick experiment to have proteins interacting and do the detection very shortly thereafter so that the complex forms can't have fallen apart yet. Um, one of the nice things about microfluidics is that we've got laminar flow, which means that we don't have convecting mix, convective mixing anymore, but we've got mixing based on uh, diffusion. So in laminar flow, we've got all the streamlines together and we slowly get diffusion from components from fluid one towards uh, from one towards two and from two towards one. So we don't have this convective mixing going on because we are at a low Reynolds number flow. Um, the speed at what that mixing works at um, is based on diffusion. <coughs> and diffusion itself, even though my equation here has been scrambled up a little bit, is dependent on the, the um, radius of the molecule. So the larger the protein, the larger the diffusion constant, the slower it will be. And that difference in diffusion constant allows you to look at binding events, because if one protein binds to another, it gets bigger. Its diffusion gets slower. So the free protein will be, will be moving from one area to another, a lot faster than the bound protein, which is something that's done here, where they look at sizing the radius of different proteins using a microfluidic device, using a microscope to actually study how wide the zone gets by using a confocal scanning throughout the channel. The rate at which this peak here gets wider 
is directly linked to its diffusion constant. The diffusion constant through the equation that just got scrambled up on my slide is directly linked to its hydrodynamic radius. So we can determine experimentally the diffusion constant from how long it takes for, to go from a relatively sharp zone when it's injected into a microchannel to diffuse out into a broad, broad zone. If we analyze, we know the time it's taken to go from the first measurement point to the last measurement point, we can measure how much broader the peak has gotten. So we know the speed at which that happens because we know distance and we know time. Through that, we can calculate back the diffusion constant. Once we know the diffusion constant, the diffusion constant is the square root of these constants divided by pi times the viscosity of the solution. If we don't change that, then we can determine RH, which is the hydrodynamic radius. So that's a uh, confocal imaging technique. Very simple microfluidics, but by imaging at known time points, we can determine the diffusion rate and we can determine the size of the protein that we're working with. Uh, this has also been used for diffusional sizing uh, for protein-protein uh, interactions that are not covalently bond, bound. So the, the analytes, again, diffuse by an amount that's inversely proportional to the hydrodynamic radius in the region when they're adjacent to one each other. Um, And then we, we can have uh, the labeling taking place. So where do we go here? I prepared this when I was still home. So I look back at the papers now. So we get the two analytes. So that's free diffusion. Ah, so we get two proteins interacting in free solution first. Then we get the addition of a fluorophore, it's mixing, and then we can look at how the fluorophore has bound one fraction or another and uh, derive back how far, how much they've interacted by what the which which side of the channel they've diffused into. But I'll have to have another look at that paper because it's um, it's too long ago that I've read this one. Okay, so here we're looking at dissociation of a complex. So we get a complex being inserted into an H filter. And if it falls apart, the small molecules that are diffusing off, diffusing into a, a further band than the ones in the center, and you can do different levels of spectroscopy depending on how far they've deviated here after the H filter, which then allows for the separation. So we've had the complex coming in it falls apart into its separate components. Based on their different diffusion, these separate components end up in different outlets because they've got different diffusion constants. So we've got complex coming in here, separates into its different fractions. The larger one will end up in the first channel. The smaller they are, in a lower bin they end. In those bins, you can either inflow, characterize them, or collect the samples that are being collected was it place How is the detector place to get all this normally detected? I would suspect that this is off-chip um, spectroscopy. So they literally have got little reservoirs sitting at the end here. And then the liquids are taken out of the chip and injected into a, a stagnant phase okay. to do the spectroscopy. It's not online. I, I don't. I, um, I suspect if it would have been online, I would have written it on here. This is not written with online detection. Online, but okay. uh, this, this here is the computational fluid dynamic simulation. This, so this is what they hope will happen. Okay. Uh, this is the distance in Y, where how the concentration drops from the high concentration here in the shunt in the narrow pit to bins one, two, three, and four. 
Maybe they've got a, uh, just a microscope and they do direct imaging. I don't know if that's fast enough. But the, most of the spectroscopy experiments I've seen have been offline. So they do the separation, then they kind of, once their fractions are collected, they freeze the separation. And they then have the time to do the spectroscopy over a much longer duration. So this is where we get back a little bit close to my comfort zone again. So here we're doing electrophoresis to do <coughs> measure the interaction between an antigen and an antibody. In affinity electrophoresis, we um, know that the migration speed that we have depends again on our size to charge ratio. If we are an antigen that's bound to the antibody, we get larger, so we get a little bit slower. By the, um, measuring the amount that an analyte gets delayed, uh, changes in migration time, we can um, derive back how long this target analyze has been spent in the bound phase and it's free solution. And that way we can, uh, by calculating those ratios, we can uh, do the experiment, the electrophoresis experiments at different um, antigen tar binding target concentrations relative to the antibody. And just like we do with any uh, binding curves, if we do that at different concentrations and we calculate the difference in, in mobility, we can determine the binding constant. So here we can see an antibody antigen complex, where at one concentration, we've got um, the slowest one is probably, this is the fastest one that will be the, the smaller one, so the analyte. So here we've got little binding, here we've got the situation reversed, we a slower peak has grown. So through the ratio of our peak, we can determine how much binding there's been going on and we can um, derive a binding constant plug. So we can, uh, in here, alpha feta protein, uh, and you can see, we can see how, how often, how much they've interacted together. We can also look at these interactions using free flow electrophoresis. So rather than looking at it statically, where we inject a single zone and we measure at the detector how one or two peaks, depending on how many of them we label, are coming out, you can also look at it in a free flow format, where you look at the amount of drift that the analyte plug has. So free flow electrophoresis, we have our sample come in. We've got our electro fields applied. Our analytes here of interest are anions, so they slowly drift towards the positive electrodes. The smaller, more agile they are, the more they will be drifting. So depending on, uh, and, and then you can either quantify using a microscopy image, you can quantify the intensity of all of these fractions or you can collect them and do further analysis with them. So here we can see the deflection. Um, you can do the intensity profiles of where uh, the fluorophore sits. And here there is uh, a fluorophore labeled comodulin in presence or absence of another enzyme. And the deflection will be changing when it is bound or free um, in presence or absence of calcium, again, from this data, you can uh, create the binding curves and derive the binding constants. So we've got the flow normally without a field. We've got a shift of this flow in presence of a field, depending on the size of the molecule. So depending if we've got binding of these two molecules, this shift will be larger or smaller. And what they've done in here is to affect, to um, verify the influence of the concentration of calcium on this binding. So they've measured the shift in presence of different concentrations of calcium and then could derive the uh, effect of calcium on the binding of the two different proteins. Here we don't have the channels now. Hmm? We don't have the channels now. It is just free flow. It is just free flow. So we've got a flow cell that's probably 50 micron high. Potential difference applied. Yes. Two panels, yes. Two panels. Two panels where a flow is taking place. And depending on the strength of the electric field, one's more faster than the other, and they come out at different outlets at the other end. So you can either collect them at the outlets separately. Yeah. Yeah. 
or you image them on the chip and you've got one big outlet. There's a lot of, so these experiments have only measured um, at the end of the cell, how far they've migrated from the center. So here they've not done any collection and then you don't need separate outlets. So you can do, but if you wanna uh, work up your proteins or do any other work, then you need to have uh, a whole network with different bits of tubing sticking out at the other end. Um, to look at things with more throughput, we can use droplets where we use an aqueous solution that's interdispersed in uh, an oil-based uh, environment. We can use them as discrete reaction containers. We've seen that as PCR, that when we had all the PCR reagents in one of these droplets and we did inject our target DNA, we got amplification. If we did not inject our target amplification in these droplets, we did not get amplification and by then counting the number of droplets that had fluorescence versus the ones that didn't have fluorescence we could quantify the amount of dna that was present in our overall solution um, these tiny little containers are very good for for studying all kinds of protein protein interactions as well um, a because we can have control on the reagents that are present in the different containers here we can see that we can have different concentrations of reagents and buffer coming in. By changing the rate at which these different pumps work, we can change the relative concentrations of these agents that end up in these droplets. If we do that dynamically, so we start off with 0% of this solution and 100% of this one, and we then go uh, 2080, 40, 60, 60, 40. So we go through the whole gradient by using the changing the relative flow rates, keeping the overall um, flow rates the same. We change the concentration of our reagents um, over time. So these droplets here may have been formed with the 100% one, 0% the other, but these, this droplet here may have been formed with 50-50. If we have a thousand or so of droplets, we can have very smoothly varying reaction conditions without actually having had to do a whole range of dilution ourselves. We slowly ramp up the flow rate of this pump. We ramp down the flow rate of this pump. They're always diluted in some buffer. And we get dynamically changing concentration gradients across our droplets, which we can then either keep that way in the chip um, and study them, and if we then can see, um, one of the examples we'll look more at later is aggregation. Then we'll see that we have no aggregation of our protein up to the point <laughs> the conditions are right, so we get crystallization for probably two or three rows of droplets. And further down, the conditions are not right for crystallization again, so we don't get crystallization. And that gives us a very good indication where the optimum for crystallization would be. You can repeat the experiments with the condition that's uh, created uh, the conditions that you'd like to have and more subtly fine-tune it, um, which is a lot faster way to optimize protein crystallization than any other, other ways around. So again, um, this could be used using FRET for studying the protein-protein interactions where um, we got only a FRET signal if our uh, target bound with the FRET probe, and we got the, the, the response, we could measure it. So here we've got a donor phase, a buffer, and the acceptor phase, we get the droplets being formed, we can change the FRET donor and the FRET acceptor concentrations, which means that our different droplets can have a different chemical composition, and we can then measure the signal for those compositions for the different droplets. Keeping in mind that our signals coming out of a droplet system will only be active once our droplet comes by and not active when our droplet is not by because that's our continuous phase where there's no none of the FRET reagents present. So these are the fluorescent bursts of the droplets coming by of the um, where the antibody, antibody 
was had a fixed concentration and the concentration of the uh, antigen, in this case, angiogen, was labeled, uh, was changed. So we have one of our two compounds that could be interacting is changing. The other one is kept constant. And again, by doing so, we can then plot the variant concentration versus the signal and get our binding curves, um, which uh, matched in this case, uh, matched the uh, traditional ways of, of doing the experiment. So we can change the experimental conditions with the concentration of the antigen that was injected relative to the antibody from 0.6 nanometers to 3 nan nanometers here. Look at that, the different intensity for the different signals from the differences in the peak height or the changes in the peak height here from the low concentration to the high concentration, we can derive the binding curves. So the y-axis here are the values measured here for the peaks with that difference that here there was not a lot of pipetting going in, a lot of uh, solutions taking place, but simply the ratio of the solutions between our donor and our acceptor solutions were changed and mixed with buffer to keep the concentration constant. So the total volume of these droplets was always the same. Uh, by changing one, you change the other in the same respect and you get the same target being present in the volume. This is what Annette just already referred to and that's a way of looking at protein aggregation. So here a large scale droplet maker was coupled to a place for easy study. So pretty much a par parking garage, a parking lot for droplets. So the droplets come in, end up in a narrow channel, and this narrow channel was made long because it made observation of the droplets easier as well. So proteins were present, some level of for surfactant, and a fluorophore to measure that was what was going on. Droplets in those trains, in those lines sitting here, all had slightly different conditions. And in these droplets, you could individually study the aggregation of the proteins because the fluorophore here only became activated once we got these fibrils, these, these clumps of, of, of protein coming together, we got them being formed. So by looking at the fluorescence intensity of these parked droplets, how that changed, we could get an idea of the protein aggregation and if these droplets were actually any good condition-wise to for protein aggregation or not. But also study it, the, uh, use it to study the dynamics of protein aggregation. So here you can see <clears throat> a single droplet where the aggregation propagates over time. So you can see the first nucleation of the first point where we get the dye being activated and being visible. Once the reaction has been started, we get more and more aggregation ha happens and you can get a long, more and more intense, but also longer and longer zone of that aggregation. So the aggregation grows over time and in length, which again allows for the de determination of um, the um, aggregation uh, aggregation rates, elongation rates of uh, at a certain monomer. So these these are the monomers from a certain monomer uh, concentration. How quickly they aggregate into that fibrin-like polymer formation. This is the quantitative data that I got out. So here we've got the elongated droplets in where we can see that actually the aggregation doesn't start in the middle here, but it starts on the edges. And by the zones getting longer and longer at a certain point, they elongate to, to yields to form one zone. So smaller the system volume gets, the longer it takes before we get any um, any signal out because of the lower prevalence of the molecules that actually could be aggregating. If we've got a large droplet, we've got a, a higher chance that we've got a point of nucleation and the reaction starts earlier. So there are a range of different protein-protein interactions where by either 
separating the proteins based on difference in diffusion constant, looking at their affinity for different phase, um, making discrete containers to study um, binding events, to study aggregation events. There's a whole toolbox to look at a whole range of protein-protein interactions. Another part of people studying proteins do analytical chemistry. And CHIP LCMS has been really popular for proteomics. Um, and we'll, we'll be looking at a couple of ways that CHIP liquid chromatography can be coupled to mass spectrometry to enhance and accelerate the workflow in proteomics. Um, lots of work has been done. Lots of challenges still in, uh, exist. So there is a whole range of different microfabricated interfaces to couple with a mass spectrometer. Um, there are monolith grids, there's nebulizers, there's nano spray emitters, there's different sheet liquids, different geometries of liquid junction interfaces. Um, the challenges that remain is actually getting a really nice sharp tip to develop that electrospray uh, remains a challenge. Integration of the electrodes for electrospray interfacing with the chip. We talked about functional integration, the difficulty in uh, getting electrodes on a chip. Again, very difficult to do. And generating sufficient flow of buffers that are compatible with the mass spec um, and smooth enough flow so that we don't get uh, jaggering because of our pumps performance remains a challenge. Um, in practice, it is uh, a lot of the electrosprays are developed for capillary chromatography or for capillary electrophoresis. The easy thing to do would be to just use those interfaces and stick them into a chip. In reality, sticking a few silica capillary into a chip is really hard um, because typically we make our channels that are accessible from the top, not from the sides. And a uh, few silica capillaries have the problem that it's rounds. Nothing is more difficult than creating a circular channel. We've seen a lot of squares for all my slides. We had the glass where we had the under etching, so we had a little bit of a rounded cup. I bet you, you haven't seen a lot of circles in my slides. Very hard to get a round peg into a square hole. So it's, it's not easy to use the technology that's already been developed for capillary electrophoresis uh, to, to just physically connect that with a microchip. Um, there are still some, some problems if you've got uh, machine flats or cut glass uh, uh, surfaces. So you've got a micro channel in your chip with your two reservoirs. Can you just use a saw to um, open up your chip so that your reservoir, your channel is pretty much at a flat edge? Um, hard again to then have an electric field that's, that's strong enough to create our electrospray interface. Um, spray nozzles are made by, from silicon processing. Silicon doesn't really like conditioning of capillaries in, in basic solutions. Um, silicon also starts, if it's a very thin silicon under high potential, we've got a problem with dielectric breakdown of the tip, which then breaks the interface and stops the experiments as well. Um, polymers may be a little bit better to make a sharp tip, but are not as conducting. And at the same time, they, they stick to a lot of proteins, may not be great for proteomics either. So despite the amount of work, there's still a lot to be done, both in the fabrication and in the material science. But what has been done is integration of a whole range of different stationary phases. So for proteomics, um, we've seen before that for DNA extraction, magnetic beads are great can do similar things with uh, micro beds where you've got beads that are uh, immobilized with, um, for example, IgE. Here you can see that with that, you can make chromatography columns by simply the fact that they don't fit through a certain hole. Here we've got particles being fed in and they can't, the liquid can get out, but the particles can't because they're, they're stuck in place. They don't fit through the hole here, which means that if we can apply a potential difference, we can separate compounds based on their difference in time that are stuck on a stationary phase. So we can do a kind of a limited kind of chromatography where we've got our IgE functionalized microbeads, proteins coming past, our proteins will be retained for different amounts of time depending on their affinity to this column before they're released into the gel and then end up in 
an enrichment flavor for, for, for further processing and or release to a mass spectrometer. Another thing that we could do is just pump a lot of reagent through, then use a magnetic bead <coughs> to collect all the protein kept on the beads in place and then move that to another area for further processing. So um, magnetic beads are a very useful tool if you want to hold something in place. Chip capillary electrophoresis mass spectrometry has been the dream of a lot of people and, and very strongly led by the Gramsci group probably since the early mid-2000s. Who remembers our cross-injection? We had our sample. Oh, this isn't cross-injection. This is, how did we call this one? If we've got our sample and our sample was sitting around the corner. Catered injection. So we have our sample going down to our sample waste in the electric field. We temporarily don't do anything with our power supplies. So we allow for the diffusion of analyte sitting at the intersection down into this channel. Then we apply the potential to our background uh, reservoir, to our other um, electrodes, which is probably our grounded part here with the mass spectrometer. And we can get an electrophoretic separation in the separation channel here. Here we've got another fluidic inlet that will allow us to get a sheath flow to support, to bulk up the flow, to have enough mass to enter into the mass spectrometer. And in this case, it's done by electrosmotic pumping. So we've got a very, very long separation channel here, 46 centimeters, and then a, a boost the flow into the spray interface using an electrosmotic pumping channel here as well, because otherwise the the rate that the liquid came out of the separation wasn't enough to sustain a stable electrospray. Could also be used for continuous infusion. So the continuous infusion sample goes in here, electroosmotic uh, sheath flow support comes in here, and together they go to this special patented nebulizer that sits at the corner of the chip. Um, so the channel ends up at the corner of the tip. The really smart thing of this is that if you're at the corner of the tip, you're automatically at a sharp edge. So we don't get any a, lo a lot of wicking <coughs> along the surfaces. We have that tip already done as a part of our cutting and our dicing of our microfluidic structures. So we don't need a little sharp thing to be sticking out that could be corroding. It is also having a lot of mass, so not as prone to dielectric breakdown than any of the other microfabricated tips we could be having. So we've got a microfluidic device, this instance with a little bit shorter channel, makeup flow, put it in front of a mass spectrometer. And what they've developed in another bit of research is develop a mass spectrometer that didn't need a very high vacuum. So it could work at higher pressure. Um, so this is the microfabricated way that the micro mass spectrometer looks like. Uh, there's no scale bar here, but from memory, this is uh, a couple of centimeters. So it is a very small mass spec where it doesn't work at very, very low vacuums, don't need huge pumps to, to vacate the air, and we can still measure the mass based on their times of flight inside the, the mass spectrometer. Um, so we've got a capillary electrophoresis mass spectrometry system. This mass spectrometer doesn't need a lot of auxiliary equipment and potentially could be taken in and into any laboratory. First, they validated the mass spectrometer. So there's, uh, again, the long capillary electrophoresis chip um, using a, a normal mass spectrometer and... Um, so the mini CIT, I'm not trying to think which one was which, the higher peak intensity was the commercial instrument. So this is a commercially available mass spec. This is the uh, chip-based mass spectrometer. Electrophoresis was being done. And if you look at the normalized ion counts coming out over time, we can see the separation, electrophoretic separation, of our three different analytes, which were three different prote proteins, so encophthalene, angiotensin, bradykinin, uh, four, yeah, I've got a fourth one there. 
uh, thymopentin. So we get them separated based on time. Fast migrating comes out first. Slow migrating comes out last. We can see that there's a small drop difference in intensity, so a loss in sensitivity going from an expensive mass spectrometer um, that requires vacuum pumps and complex pumping um, to a portable handheld mass spectrometer. And uh, selective ion chromatography mm -hmm. could be made, could be collected with this field portable uh, mass spectrometer as well. You can see the N over C that was selected, fragmented into the smaller components. So it works like a normal mass spec, but it doesn't have the bulk of equipment that comes with the larger mass specs, which means it can be easier used either on the bench top in the proteomics lab or potentially even taken into clinics. Other than dealing with all the issues of mass uh, time of flight mass spectrometry, another option is to actually use the uh, a spray coming out of a microfluidic device, in this case held by a little piezoelectric activator, to spray the outlet of a microfluidic device onto a melding plate. And then you can immobilize any kind of separation that you've done, any kind of purification that you've done, and fractionate into different spots on your melody plate, whatever's coming out of your proteomic sample. And then you can um, have a stage. So have your melody substrate sitting here on a movable stage. Every new separated zone that's coming out of the spray, uh, you move the stage a little bit, and you know the location where which fraction has been deposited. After you've done your microfluidic processing, um, you collect your moldy plate, you take it to the moldy, you know screening from one side of your multi plate to the other, where your different fractions should be sitting, and you can record using a normal multi mass spectrometer. You can um, see where your different fractions have been ended up. On the microfluidic devices, we can't only do one-dimensional separations; we can do multi-dimensional separations as well, which becomes really useful for complex protein mixtures. In this instance, we've got a, a chip where we combine two electrophoretic techniques. First, we've got a gel-based electrophoresis. So we've got cross-injection here of our sample to sample waste. We get our separation between C and D. So we've got our first separation. Then we can, whatever comes on the injection, in the injection cross here, by activating the voltage here, we can do SDS, um, no, we can do MEKC. So we've got gel electrophoresis happening in this dimension. We can collect the sample, inject it here again, and do an MEKC, an affinity, a distribution between the micelle separation down in our second dimension. So a single chip for multi-dimensional separation. And then we can make these kind of heat maps when we sequentially inject them. So we've got the dimension how they're coming out of the gel electrophoresis sitting here across, poorly retained in the gel, so probably small, strongly retained in the gel. And then we've got the MEKC dimension sitting here, where we've got not really in high affinity with our micelles, high affinity with the micelles. And we get a heat map uh, represented here, where we can see that, that we get most of our loading here. If we present it slightly differently with a... Um, the peaks sticking out, we can have an idea of the multitude of different components you can analyze, combining two different analytical techniques with one and another. Um, Prost translational modification, the glycosylation is another hot topic in, in proteomics and also can be worked on with uh, microfluidic devices like the Ramsey's developed chip with the spray interface. Um, there's, there's different saccharides uh, sequences being bound to the proteins, which is increasingly realized how important they are for the biological functionality of these proteins. Using chip CEMS can separate uh, these proteins or even do a, a glycosylation step, do an enzymatic digestion before or on the chip before you do the separation. And here we can see, based on the different mass profiles coming off the chip spread into the mass bag, we can uh, identify based on 
the migration time, what class they are, and based on the mass, we can identify what the glycosylation order is if we use um, the extracted ion electrophorograms. So we've got a triptych digest here where we've got a total electrophorogram, and then we can look at different masses, what the profiles are, and start understanding the glycosylation profiles. Just like normal CEMS would do, but then the separation is done faster on the microchip. Phosphorylation um, of proteins is as important as the glycosylation. And here we have, I think this was an antibody based one. Yes. So here we're, we're not doing mass spectrometry anymore, but we've got um, a detection with an ELISA using a phosphorization uh, reagent. So a library of different affinity agents is spotted on a glass slide for monitoring the expression, uh, the phosphorylation profiles of different proteins. So this in here is not a large pink sheet. This is actual all individual chambers where these, um, this library has been spotted on. Uh, so there's DNA and protein chambers that can be opened up or closed down using the hydrophobic valves. Um, if there's a lysate, some proteins may be expressed in our DNA uh, uh, chambers, provided the right code is there. Um, I bet that's the way that this one works. So if the right enzymes, um, the right protein is being expressed, we can get the synthesis of uh, that protein using the histec in chambers. Um, the protein expressed in the lysate uh, will have, if they have uh, photophosphorization, they will photophosphorize. The other ones won't do the phosphorization. And then you can measure the uh, phosphorization using an ELISA-like assay, where you get two antibodies sticking together before getting your um, uh, reagent. And then by comparing the synthetic DNA library with the cell-based library, um, you can get an understanding of what the, um, the difference in phosphorylation or if the uh, cell extract actually did express any phosphorylation or not. Um, microfluidic devices have been very useful for just doing digestion on the chip as well. And the easiest way that can be done is just immobilize trypsin on the inside of a microchannel. So you can um, functionalize the microchannel so that you can covalently attach trypsin. Then you pump your uh, protein mixture, you pump it through. It is continuously in contact with the trypsin. So by the time it comes out of the chip, you've got protein digest. And as you can see, microfluidic digest works as well as a normal in-free solution digest. Here we've got uh, CZD peptide maps of some E. coli from memory. Pretty sure that this was an E. coli thing. Uh, but yeah, you've got the digest and you can see that the, the, the high peaks, the low peaks, the profiles are very similar. We get effective digestion in a microfluidic flow cell. Desalination is another thing that's important in protein processing. If we work with larger volume, making smaller cells, smaller dialysis cells is important as well. And here we have a membrane integrated device with a little serpentine channel sandwich it together with the dialysis membrane, sample goes in, retentate gets collected here, permeate whatever comes through can be collected at the other end, and then we can, um, proteins don't fit through the dialysis membrane, so stay in the retentate, can be injected into the mass spec, high salt is highly mobile, small molecule will pass through the dialysis membrane into the permeate site, and here we can inject a desalted protein sample, which means that we can uh, can do better mass spec because pro, uh, sodium adducts always destroy the mass spec. So here we've got um, a little bit of an idea on, on what the, the charging effects are in the sensitivity of the mass spec with 100% a millimolar potassium chloride. Much, much nicer mass spec for the standard where we don't have any salts present 
And here we can see after one or two passes through the dialysis module, that we can actually rescue how crap this mass spec here looks like by increasingly removing the salts. So we can do a very simple microfluidic flow cell to clean up our protein sample and get much, much nicer mass spec data through the removal of our salts. Um, proteomics is nice on the big scale, even nicer if you can do it small. So there's a lot of work going on using microfluidic devices to sort single, rare or, or special cells. And once these single cells have been separated, they can be used for single cell analysis, where every single cell is, um, is collected, lysed, digested, desalted, and then used for shotgun proteomics for protein profiling. So once a special cell comes by, the red ones are may not be interested, but the blue ones will be. Once a special cell is detected, it goes to a special outlet, ends up as a single cell in a vial, then that single cell, um, or here, uh, larger amount of cells, but groups of cells, but even single cells can be then processed and used for protein profile on the uh, first separated based on certain characteristic and then on a very low volume throughput. Single cell analysis, we also, um, the different things that you want to know uh, targeted analysis by mass spec is when you know what protein you're after and immunoassays are fine. If you know the protein you want to measure, you can get an antibody, you can measure it. But a lot of the proteins that are important in the cells are not known, which is where mass spec comes in because you can start doing proteomics and find out what the protein is. Well, this kind of gaining popularity at the moment is actually understanding the role of the importance of the location of the protein which is where a whole range of imaging techniques come in. So traditionally, we only did imaging with microscopes. These days, we've got increasing imaging mass spectrometry happening as well. So uh, is it a nuclear protein? Is it a cytoplasmic protein um, or secreted protein? So there's mass spec imaging where we've got a cell where we selectively sample for different parts. There is um, electrochemiluminescence imaging to, again, get an idea of the location where a certain um, cell is present. So we've gone from the analysis and doing proteomics on a large soup of cells to do single cell analysis. And we're now moving to the part where we actually move to different locations in a cell to look where the proteins are being expressed. And of course, you need microfluidic tools, the ability to handle reagents in very small volumes in order to do so, because we can deal with uh, a tube, even if a single cell is in there, we really need new technology if we want to look at the absolute locations where proteins are expressed, preferably in a dynamic manner. Uh, single cell immunoassays here, we've got different groups of cells that can be distributed over on, on uh, a microfluidic device. They can get uh, barcodes by which the, they can be recognized what group they're part of based on imaging cytometry and then be um, introduced in micro-engraved tiny little wells where immunoassays can be done, where you know can derive back later on that a protein that had been detected as being um, a membrane-based protein also contains antibody number X, which leads to very complex data processing but the nice thing about these microarrays, these micrograded proteins, they can be fabricated in large scale. There is great printing technique available for the reagents. So the fabrication of these arrays is actually not that hard. And the amount of extra data you get on a single cell level and on a cell population level provides you insight on how protein levels are distributed within the cell population. Um, in addition to, uh, so here we were looking at spatial and spectral encoding, so there were different wavelengths where different labels were that, but also different bars where those labels were present. So there's different bars in a little microtank chamber with a cell. Each of these bars have an antibody for a specific reagents. So if we've got our single cell sitting um, in a single reservoir with this bar sitting overneath and it's excreting a certain protein 
it may bind to any of the affinity bars that sit on top. Imaging after a little while actually allows you to measure the fluorescent signal if there's a detection uh, agent being added as, uh, as well and allows you to do multi-cell profiling using an amino assay at a single cell level. So we've got a container here and we've got lots of the container sitting. So we've got a single cell sitting here in each individual box. We've got a range of different affinity agents that is patterned in a line because they're placed perpendicular. There's a whole range of different assays that can be done on the secret file or this little cell sitting here and then detection antibody can be added later on and you can get dynamic spots on how the different protein levels that have been excreted change for this cell population. This is the way that that looks in detail. And yeah, this one of the last one. And this one in here actually looks at a much more applied way to measure the proteins that have been excreted. It also looks at that in the way that the cells are moving. So if I might two different cells are being loaded in, and different antibodies or excreted uh, proteins can be measured with all the character strips, which is like in the previous paper. The cool thing that I did here well is they also measure the location of the cells. And if this cell was pretty something that this one liked, they got pushed together. If that was not the case, they are just stationary or they moved further away, which then allowed for studying cell to cell communication because this cell um, may get a signal from that cell to um, get closer and get more communication. So here you can see cells start off reasonably close, they drift further and further apart because they're telling each other something um, that means that they don't want to be. So the analysis of a structure where a protein is, is bound with a ligand um, can be studied with deuterium exchange. However, the, the um, measurement that needs to be really, really